What place does religious belief, which depends not on rational thinking or scientific proof, but simple faith, have in the modern world? Religion has inspired beautiful art and fueled acts of terrible violence. It's provoked bloody sacrifice and led to lives of great devotion. Are people who devote their lives to something that can never be proved wasting their time? Is the very idea of religious belief evidence of flawed, even demented thinking? I think that, that there is a God. I, I think Christ was who he said he was, you know. Uh, maybe that makes me totally mad, but that's what I think. Is someone who believes the Holy Spirit is speaking through them in the language of angels entitled to our respect? Or in need of psychological treatment? What happens when the worlds of hard science and pure faith meet? So are you the scientist who's going to prove the existence of God? I don't have a previously arranged agenda as to whether I'm trying to disprove or prove God. I'd love to be able to do one or the other. Where does a sincere belief in God meet behavior which is odd, bizarre, or even damaging to others? Up. Up. What is normal in the world Nothing. of spiritual belief? Give the Lord a mighty shout of hallelujah. I've been a clinical psychologist for 18 years. I was trained to interpret individuals' beliefs and behaviours using an empirical, evidence-based, rational approach. Traditionally in our secular society, religious devotion, where beliefs and behaviours are based not on hard facts but on simple faith, has been regarded by mental health professionals as at best irrelevant and at worst as a manifestation of mental illness. But I believe there is often a very fine line between behaviour we may find eccentric, but which we regard as acceptable, and behaviours we write off as abnormal. Freedom from sin brings freedom within. People say, I can't get free, I can't get free, I can't get free of sin. The Apostle Paul said that. If you live in London, you'll have seen and almost certainly heard Phil Howard. There are characters like him in towns and cities up and down the country. Phil goes out on the street every day, spreading a traditional Christian message of sin and salvation. We always like to get out there today and preach that gospel and bring the good news of Jesus Christ. So don't die sinners, when you can die winners. Phil says he gave up a successful, conventional career as a businessman in Liverpool and left behind family and friends to devote his life to saving the souls of Londoners, whether they want to be saved or not. And he knew how to play in the game of life. Most of us walk past people like Phil without really noticing them, or we roll our eyes and dismiss him as a nuisance, or maybe worse, and then don't give him further thought. But why is Phil less worthy of our respect than the Catholic priest who asks his congregation to believe they're eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus Christ? Or the Shia Muslim who whips himself with chains until he draws blood to prove his devotion to Allah? Or the Orthodox Jew who believes God ordered Abraham to kill his firstborn son? I myself as a Christian evangelist, a sinner when a man of London who wants to turn London to a safer capital and bring people back from sinners to winners back to God. How does one go from being a sinner to being a winner? You just repent, you say, okay, God, I've done wrong, I accept I've done wrong, I accept you die on the cross. Come on, live in me, forgive me for my sin, now teach me how to live right. If you read the Bible, you learn the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. And living right would be what? Not lying, not gossiping, not being nasty by it. In other words, don't do to others. Them to do to you. What does gospel mean? God's only son proclaims eternal life. And what does Jesus mean? Jesus eternally saves us sinners. That's what he's going to do. If you just listen to what Phil is saying, the words he uses can be heard in pulpits up and down the country every Sunday. But it's where he's saying it as well as the way he says it which makes us feel uncomfortable. Taken out of a religious setting, Phil comes across as a bit obsessed. And there's something about the zealot that we tend not to trust. Phil has to fight for the attention of the passing world, demanding that people listen to his message of salvation. His reward has sometimes been ridicule, abuse, and even an ASBO. Do people ever question your sanity? Um, Have people ever thought that you were crazy or tried to get somebody to assess you mentally or, not or anything? Not Christianity, no. But uh, 
as far as I'm concerned, people get all crazy ideas and crazy thoughts in the head because they're crazy themselves and the mind of man, as God said, is crazy. So people always try and put the negativity on you. When to me, if they go around lying, gossiping and bitching about one another, to me, they're crazy. Me, I'm just preaching live right, don't live wrong, so that's me as normal. Do you ever sin, young man? Do you ever sin? Do you ever tell lies? Do you ever swear? Yeah, 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 I'm not a true Christian yet. Mental health researchers have found that strong religious belief is highly prevalent among people diagnosed as schizophrenic. But it's also well established that a high percentage of those diagnosed with mental illness say their religious belief helps them cope with their illness and life in general. Dr. Andrew Powell is a retired psychiatrist who believes that mental health professionals must be prepared to set aside their scepticism about matters of faith and engage with their patients. Well, religion um, has had a bad press in psychiatry mm. and it's understandable because some people who get really ill um, are tormented by religious uh, delusions um, and, and so the problem has been that psychiatrists have tended to see that um, as something that needs treating in order to get the person better. Mm. I've worked with many patients, just to say, who mm -hmm. have said to me, I am too afraid to talk about my yeah. spiritual beliefs, my religious beliefs, to my psychiatrist or to you, my psychologist, exactly. because I am afraid that you will then hear these stories and say further evidence that you're mad. There's a problem there that isn't otherwise being understood. Mm -hmm. And it's nobody's fault. It's to do with the history of how psychiatry developed out of medicine and neurology, the split between science and the church, which put, you know, religious beliefs over there and mm -hmm. science over here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's time that we began to pull these very separate parts together. Normally as a psychologist, if I was presented with the case of an elderly woman who lived behind closed doors, avoided contact with the outside world, and barely spoke to another human being, I would at least consider the possibility that she was depressed, possibly deluded, and probably severely agoraphobic. Sister Mary is the prioress of a Carmelite monastery in West London. She has chosen to spend nearly 40 years hidden away from the outside world, locked in a private conversation with God. When I was 18, I think it was an experience of visiting a, a monastery of Benedictine monks in France. They were contemplative monks. And something clicked that by devoting my whole life totally and utterly to God, I was giving absolutely everything I wanted to be used wherever it would be most of value, but without my having to manipulate or manoeuvre it. I couldn't find anything big enough to throw my whole energies into until I found that, giving myself to God. And why is separation from the world so important? Um, it was a tradition in the order. It springs really from the very early Christian custom of going out into the desert after you know, the, the third, fourth century as being the only place where you could live a totally authentic Christian life in a pagan world. Right. Was separate, no, going out into the desert to be alone with God, to face, to face one's inner demons, really. So the ideal of going into a desert space was quite an important one for anybody leading a serious life of prayer. Despite the fact that I don't share Sister Mary's religious beliefs or certainties, I was engaged by her in a way that I wasn't with Phil. Was this because Mary behaves in the way we've come to expect the religious to? Is it all about context? And what should we make of her conviction that she has a direct personal relationship with an all-powerful but unseen God? I can remember sitting on the staircase at home as a wee child when you sat on one step and your feet fitted nicely on the next. And um, just going into kind of a blank abstraction, almost on purpose, to get this wonderful sense of infinity, eternity, immensity, delight. And coming to, with the name of Jesus, still only half spoken on my lips, and realising that Jesus was even bigger than all these things I was seeing, something which I could never have put into words I knew that Jesus and God were equivalent terms, but I couldn't explain that. Mm. But it was just the background of my life. It was as real as my parents were real to me and my siblings were real to me. Mm. 
From a strictly rational and scientific point of view, the belief that more than 2,000 years ago, a man called Jesus was born the Son of God, and that he died and rose from the dead, is irrational and inherently illogical. But it's people like Phil that society judges as odd, even mad, not the nuns. In the end, it seems to me that it's the way they present their beliefs rather than what they actually believe, which makes society decide to respect one of them and ridicule the other. Do you fear that there could be examples of people, true believers, people with real faith, real conviction, a real connection with their God, with Jesus, who would have been labelled as mad, who would have been persecuted actually for those beliefs? It's quite likely. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that happens? I suppose anything abnormal is frightening to the normal, isn't it? I mean, we, we put these labels on of what's normal and what's not normal. It is highly likely that many people would see this as being abnormal. How does that make you feel? There's an old saying of somebody pointing out to a Carmelite monastery saying, oh, that's where women live silly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a kind of standing joke with us. That's where women live silly. Do you live silly? I don't think so. <laughs> if you want to be cool, you've seen we live a very down-to-earth, ordinary kind of life, really. In fact, life in the convent is anything but ordinary. These women rise at 5.20 every morning and follow a strict regime of prayer, meditation and manual work. Much of each day is spent in silence. When they're not working in the kitchen or gardens, the nuns also make and cut wafers to represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the Catholic rite of Holy Communion. The nuns go to bed at 9.30 each night, and they all expect to live and die behind these walls. I couldn't imagine choosing such a strict and self-denying lifestyle, and I was intrigued to discover that one of the nuns was the same age as me. What brought you to, to living this kind of life? What, why did you make this choice? It's, an, it's, a, it's a huge commitment. In a sense, um it was more kind of answering a call. It was like I had a good job, I was in the Wrens, so I could have made a good career. Uh -huh. um, but it, I was still aware very much that um, life held something else. Susan made it seem like an easy decision to turn her back on the outside world. But I wondered if that decision was more about a personal need than any divine calling. So you were 20, how old were you? 24. You were 24, yeah. what, when you, would it be mm. fair to say you found God? Or he found you, or he called you. Mm, yeah, yeah. And and you said that 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 searching came out of a longing for, for something for a. Yeah, well, I think I was aware of a kind of an emptiness in myself. Like I say, I had a good job, had friends, um, I had boyfriends, but um, there was just something missing. Um, so that was where I suppose, in a sense, I kept searching without really being conscious of it a lot of the time. You know, um, it was kind of looking around. When I was 24, I was, which would have been around the same time, I was training uh, as a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, I had boyfriends and, and we probably lived, you know, similar yeah. life of, of mm -hmm. women of our age. And I also had a longing. And mm -hmm. then, um, and for me, uh, that was my husband. And, and, yeah. and he, yeah. in a sense, I found him. Mm -hmm. Do you think we both, at the age of 24, fell in love with someone? I fell in love well, yeah, with someone. Yeah, of course it is, yeah. And so we talk about searching for God, but the, uh, one of the saints is that, you know, we can only search because he's actually um, kind of calling first. He's looking for us first. It's actually a response from within ourselves. Why, why did he call you, do you think? I have no idea. <laughs> really, you, you genuinely no. have no idea? No. How do you completely walk away from everything, family, friends, motherhood, everything, for something that you actually don't really know whether it, it really is what, what you believe it is? Well, I suppose, you see, because I, I do know, really. I haven't got any proof, but I know. It's like... Sometimes, um, you know, you can know something in your head yes. and you can know something in your heart. Yes. And there's quite a difference. Yes, absolutely. It's not an intellectual thing. Faith is something that's far deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not even something you can really explain to another person. It's just something you know is right, is there. The nun's decision to concentrate on a life of prayer rather than going out to work in the real world, where they might offer practical help to others, could be seen as a strange choice. Why lock yourself away? Why not go out there and be amongst people 
I suppose, really, um, you have to understand the power of prayer. There's no evidence um, for the power of prayer. No, and that's why it calls for sheer faith, really. Right. But um, I knew, before I entered, I visited the Carmel near Leeds. I remember one sister there, she had been a nurse, and she'd worked out on the famine relief in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And she said there, she realised there that as one person, you can only do so much physically. Mm -hmm. With the power of prayer, you, you, you can do impossible things. And will you spend the rest of your life here? Yes, as far as I know. Right. Unless some indication suggested otherwise. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And that for you is how you want it to be? Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. The nuns believe they have a personal and direct relationship with God, and they're clearly unconcerned by the lack of any scientific evidence of his existence. There's a long tradition in all religions of the devout claiming to have had direct communication with God. Often these claims were met with derision, even persecution, and sometimes labelled as a form of madness. Some argue that paying respect to established religions can mean turning a blind eye to irrational, illogical and sometimes dangerous beliefs. Former MP and newspaper columnist Matthew Paris is proud to call himself an atheist. I don't have a lot of doubt anymore. I, I, I think it's a mistake, uh, religion. I, I, I think that God doesn't exist. I am not absolutely 100% certain of that any more than I'm not absolutely 100% certain that there isn't an elephant in the next room. There may be, but I think it's highly unlikely. Of course, I know lots of very nice Christians and their, their Christianity doesn't make me angry at, at all, but, but I get irritated with laziness of mind, with bad arguments and with a reaching for the comfort of something that in some part of their brain they must know is, is um, unprovable and, and perhaps not true. And yet we know that every society throughout history has believed in a deity of some kind. Maybe it's part of the human condition. Maybe it's normal for us to have some kind of religious faith or spiritual belief. But in the modern world, there can be a fine and sometimes treacherous line between believing you're hearing the voice of God and telling others that you hear voices. It's been said that if you speak to God, it's prayer. But if God speaks back, you're a schizophrenic. Just, just one of the voices. Can you tell us anything about any of the others? The other voices are around, and they're at the back of me, and they're outside of me, and they swear at me the whole time. They're really uh, unpleasant. Um, Do you know who they are? No, I don't know who they are. And when I turn around, there's nobody there. The University of Manchester is running a unique research programme which directly challenges our usual understanding of madness. All the people in this room hear voices in their head and they've all been previously diagnosed and treated as mentally ill. Have you been, Kate? Um, no, so good. I keep thinking the window's going to fall in. Voices are just telling me it's going to fall in. It's going to... You know, a spaceship's going to come in because my voices are aliens. But what if we decide to stop thinking that those who hear voices are mad, but instead are unhappy people who've had bad experiences and who need to be listened to, not labelled and feared? We all have an inner voice. I mean, this is a perfectly normal aspect of the human mind. And actually, it's, it's, it's well understood by psychologists, and, and uh, uh, its development in childhood has been mapped out in a great deal of detail. What happens is that when we're about sort of, two and a half years of age, we learn the neat trick of talking to ourselves. We, we realise that we can actually say something, but also follow our own instructions. So we talk to ourselves out loud. This is stage when kids run around and they talk to themselves. Professor Richard Bentall has devoted much of his career as an experimental clinical psychologist to challenging concepts like schizophrenia and the way we think about those who say they hear voices or express irrational beliefs. There are huge problems with this kind of account of what madness is and an alternative account is beginning to emerge, sort of has emerged over the last kind of 10 or 20 years, I suppose, uh, which looks at madness as just a kind of part of normal human variation. So there are some people who have strange experiences, who behave in ways which seem to be out of the ordinary, which other people maybe see as disturbing or unacceptable. Um, 
and those people, so those are the people who get called mad. But there's no sort of cut-off point between who's mad and who's not mad. Um, there's just a sort of distribution of, of within the, the population of different types of experiences. It sounds to me that you're saying the way we understand madness and the way we conceptualise mental illness is, is restrictive, is unscientific, and we need to challenge that. One of the main downsides is it just treats these people as if they are sort of different species, that we have one species of individuals who are sort of normal people, who have kind of privileged access to reality, we know what's going on in the world, uh, we're right. And there's this other group of people who are deranged, out of touch with reality, not responsible for their actions, and people who basically need to be controlled for, for their own good. Could I just ask, um, the voices that you hear, are they voices that you recognise? Do they have an identity? Yeah, yeah sometimes I can hear up to 20, 30 voices, but sometimes it's not audible. It's like a crowd of people that's behind you and perhaps talking about you, rather, but you can't really pick the identities out of them, of them all. Right. Peter Bullimore has been hearing voices for two decades. Today he's helping psychologist Dr Sarah Tai to understand what it's like to have other people's voices in your head all the time. OK, and um, when you hear your voices, how long do they last? Um, they used to go away for a while, but since my father passed away suddenly a year ago, they've been there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. OK, so it's not that you hear the voice and it's a few seconds, it's much it's longer... all day, as I'm talking to you now, they're still there, yeah. Uh, I think they got me to a point, they did push me to breaking point, and I basically wanted a way out, and that way out was death, really. I tried to want to, I wanted to kill myself to get rid of the voices. So, to make them stop? Yeah, yeah. Oh. To mainstream psychiatry, Peter is a textbook schizophrenic. He has a history of being sectioned or locked up under the Mental Health Act. But the root of the voices in Peter's brain is not far from that which inspired Sister Mary. As I grew up and went through school, and I'm sure the same for you, I was told it's acceptable to hear voices, and so were you. How? Because we did religious education. Jesus spoke to God. Paul on the road to Damascus spoke to a bright light. Moses spoke to a burning bush. So we're told it's acceptable. Then when you actually hit, do start to hear voices for some reason and you speak out about it, we have a tendency in our society to punish people. And so therefore people won't talk. For the last 20 years, Peter was repeatedly hospitalised and given large doses of antipsychotic drugs. Nothing stopped the voices in his head. Is, is, is this voice talking to you now? Yes. And um, what's it saying? Don't tell her anything or she'll burn in hell. I'll burn in hell? No, I will burn in hell so if I tell you anything. It, OK. I can't talk to the voice though, can I? Um, possibly. So if I said to the voice, I I'm talking to Peter because I respect the work he's doing and the experiences he's having and you need to leave us alone, yeah. what's the voice saying? I don't really want to say on camera. Say it. <laughs> Fuck <No>. off. <laughs> right. OK. So this is a voice that is it's pernicious, it's there all the time and it, yeah. and, and it, and it wants to control yeah. you. It's not always the dominant voice. Well, it is the dominant voice in content, but at times uh, when I've heard my me, me grandfather that's passed away and I've heard my mum, uh, I'll, when I focus on them more than the negative, they become the dominant voice, they become positive, mm -hmm. and I actually think that they actually enhance my life hell of a lot. Peter has not only found a way of coping with the voices in his head, he now works with psychologists, psychiatrists and other voice hearers to help normalise what many still regard as a sign of madness. I've actually heard my mum's voice. Is your mum alive, Brian? No, she's dead. She's dead. Um, I started getting the, the, the voice around the same time as my mum died. Um, and that was a comforting voice for me. Right. You know, she used to, um... If we can set our prejudice to one side, we might recognise that when the external pressures are strong enough, we are all vulnerable to moments of confusion that can be wrongly interpreted as madness. So it frightens us, but the truth is that we, we could all experience it. Yes. I, I mean, I had an experience not long after my father died, which was I was away in a hotel room mm -hmm. on business. I woke up and he was sitting there. And that's you, very, very common. Yes, it is common. But it also, some people would say, that's a bit mad. How can it be mad when it is a, such a universal human experience? Interestingly enough, there is research but on that. But people don't talk about it, really, though. Well, people don't want I to know, talk about it. Isn't that the problem? Perhaps I, if absolutely. we just all talked about these things a bit more, perhaps they would just seem less frightening. I mean, it's, it's interesting. There has been quite a lot of research on bereavement hallucinations, as they're sometimes called. And they usually occur in the context of there being a sort of very strong positive bond with the person who's gone. Mm. And they're usually comforting, mm. which is how you've described your experience. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's not a great stretch to see that the mind, when, you know, in a state of loss, wants to believe that there's still a connection with the person there.
My own experience of what might be considered a mad moment has broadened my understanding of how we should respond to experiences beyond the boundaries of scientific fact. So did talking with voice hearers like Peter Bullimore. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it's about living with them, isn't it? Instead yeah. of getting rid of, you can alter the relationship. That's right. I can't get rid of them. Yeah. I think it's a problem psychiatry makes when it says we're going to get rid of voices. Right, so you sort of fragment them away from the individual, yeah. but actually what you're saying is integrate them, make it part of who you are. Have a relationship with them, understand them. Are you mad, would you say? Um, no, I have been mad. I've acted mad. Mm. I don't think I'm mad. What would you say to people who listen to this conversation are thinking, he's, he's crazy, he's nuts, he's mad? I would say I think you need to have a reality check yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, mm. who are you? Because mm. I don't think we ever know where we really are. And what are the voices saying to the questions I'm asking you at the moment? They just keep saying to me, you're doing well. You're so the well. demonic one's gone? It's still in the background, she's still having a go, but so what? When the people who hear voices are hearing the voice of God or a voice from somewhere else, it's clear that the brain is susceptible to the power of persuasion from within or from without. We can accept some forms of religious belief and even respect those who believe they are in touch with God provided they present their beliefs in a safe and predictable context. But because Britain is one of the least overtly religious societies in the world, we can find overt expressions of religious belief outside of traditional surroundings a bit embarrassing, even sometimes a little threatening. Every Sunday morning, when most of us are enjoying a lion, thousands of young people from all over the world gather to display their devotion to Jesus Christ in London's West End. Like I was going to a church up in Rugby, but the energy here is just so amazing. And now I live in South End, but I still come in every Sunday to see this church. Some people are a bit like, why would you get up on Sunday morning to, you know, do this? This place is just, it changes your life totally. I don't think there's anything in this world that can stop me from coming here because it fills you up. Like, I feel fulfilled now. God's awesome. JC on the hookup. Hillsong Church is an evangelical Christian movement which has had enormous success in making old-fashioned religion more relevant to the young. Within moments of the service starting, the audience is in apparent ecstasy. It's not really that different from a rock concert or a football match. To believers, this euphoria is the result of being touched by God. To a psychologist, it seems more like the result of a highly suggestible audience being whipped up to a heightened state of emotion. I can spot all the classic signs of arousal typically found in large gatherings. The raised arms, communal singing, closed eyes and easy intimacy with other believers suggest a learned experience where open expressions of faith are both expected and encouraged. Thank you. I just, you know, want to tell you how great God has been and is being in my life. You know, just really turned my life around. I was... Former pop singer and talent show judge Sunita is one of the founding members of the Hillsong Church in London. So in the end, instead of it being a fantastic time, I was lonely, I was fed up, I was bored, I was isolated, and I was out of it because I was taking drugs. I kind of spiraled really out of control and went... When drugs and life as a celebrity brought Sunita to near mental collapse, she finally gave in to family pressure and attended a small religious gathering that quickly grew into Hillsong Church, UK. And it sounds great. When her then-boyfriend Simon Cowell saw what was happening, he thought Sunita was going crazy and that she'd fallen into the hands of a cult. Um, I remember Simon came to see... Simon? What, Simon Cowell came to see what it was that I'd gotten myself caught up in because I didn't want to sing, I didn't want to do anything for a while. I just wanted to, I was finding myself, which everyone seemed to think was ridiculous. And Simon literally tried to physically drag me out. He was like, what is this? This is, I thought you were going to some nice little church. This is not a church, this is a cult. And I was like, no, no, no. He tried to drag me out and I had to explain to him, look, it's Bible based, it's just that it's modern and it's in English we understand. And no, we don't have incense and communion, but it's, it's, it's you know, just Christianity. There is a belief that, that someone who suddenly becomes very religious is having some kind of mental breakdown. Yeah, I think so. And the thing is, I just 
suddenly realize everything is like smoke and mirrors. Everything's back to front. And I think I did lose my mind, but I was losing an unhealthy mind and gaining a good one. And I was having my brain thoroughly washed because I suddenly could see things in the correct perspective. When you hear Sunita say that she needed to lose her mind and have her brain washed, you can understand why Simon Cowell was worried. But Sunita's decision to remake herself as a child of God has undoubtedly brought her happiness. Modern secular society, however, is uncomfortable with behaviour based not on hard fact, but blind faith. What was interesting, though, in the sermon that we were listening to earlier is one of the things that, that, that was said was, don't try and understand, just believe. Well, that's the thing. Faith, is, that's what faith is. It's the ability to believe in the things that aren't seen. Does the simple fact of believing in something that you can't see make you a suitable case for treatment? Or should we base our beliefs only on what can be proved to be true? Someone like me, who is pretty damn sure that religion is not true, does need to ask why people believe it. Well, one explanation could be that they're just making an honest mistake, and it's not mentally ill to make an honest mistake. It's not always mentally ill to think you've seen something when you haven't. It's not mentally ill to succumb to peer group pressures. Everybody in your church believes, so you believe. But you do meet religious people, and I have met religious people in whom the fervor, something in their eyes, something in the quiver of their voice, suggests to me either that they've seen God or that they're unbalanced. And uh, I incline to the second explanation. I don't think the excitement in Hillsong is any kind of evidence of mental disorder. The people here are clearly finding meaning and contentment from their beliefs and behaviours and causing no harm. The Pentecostals are the fastest growing church in Christianity. Their 500 million followers, mostly from Africa, Asia and Latin America, believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, God and the Devil, heaven and hell. Many also believe in what they call speaking in tongues. Is this a sign of God or a sign of disorder? Psychologist Chris French has studied religious phenomena like speaking in tongues around the world. What this looks like to, to the outside observer is suddenly people start babbling essentially um, the idea of speaking in tongues is that this is some kind of manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit typically within Christian religious groups and the idea is that these messages that are coming through will actually need to be interpreted by someone who has the gift of interpretation and they can tell you what the what the message from God is all about now when these kind of utterances have been subjected to analysis by linguists, it's clear that in fact they are pure gibberish. There is no proper linguistic structure there at all. But while some psychologists dismiss speaking in tongues as gibberish, evangelical Christians believe this is a spontaneous and divine manifestation of the Holy Spirit, expressing the voice of God through a human vessel. I would say there's no evidence there that there's anything divine going on. What the evidence does suggest is that you've actually got a kind of learned behaviour to some extent. Um, people in these kind of congregations have lots and lots of opportunity and encouragement to actually model this kind of behavior. They see other people performing in this way. This is taken as evidence of some kind of, of blessing. Very often it's seen as being a kind of transition point. The first time you speak in tongues is the time when you get rid of your old sinful life and take on this new virtuous life. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots and lots of reinforcement for doing that. What happens when rational belief is confronted with pure faith? 
America is one of the most scientifically advanced and also one of the most religious societies on Earth. I've come here to find out what science can tell us about faith when it comes to speaking in tongues. Reverend Jerry Stolfus is a fundamentalist Christian who believes the Holy Spirit can speak through him. Within moments of speaking in tongues, he seems normal again. So what has just happened? I think it is my spirit talking. And so when I pray in tongues, I am believing that the Holy Spirit is interpreting for me what I don't know how to say or don't even know what I should say. Because together. words themselves are inadequate in that moment. Words are inadequate. They, and the whole human uh, body of wisdom and knowledge is inadequate to explain or describe what a person is feeling. That's why we're still trying. So my understanding would be, uh, and this comes from Romans 8.26, it says that the Holy Spirit makes interpretation for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And it's talking there about those um, pre-verbal times when there is no way to express what you're feeling. So in a sense, it's, it's a very primitive, regressed emotional state, is what you're hmm. saying. Am I hearing you correctly? I don't think so at all. No? No, I don't think you're hearing me correctly at all. Help me, help me I think it is. I think it is a, an admission that there are some things language doesn't touch and therefore looking for some other way to work at that expression. There's no evidence that there really is any message there. Now what that means is that then whoever is doing the interpreting can make anything of that message that they want to. And typically the way it's interpreted is in terms of the particular version of the religion that's being preached in that particular congregation. Mm -hmm. So all of that would suggest that although it may look to the those who believe that this is some kind of evidence of being touched by God. In actual fact, I, I'd say the evidence very strongly suggests it isn't. So, is this all just a figment of Jerry's imagination, or is there actually something physical going on in his brain which would enable him to speak with the voice of God? Normally, scientists shy away from any exploration of religious phenomena for fear of their colleagues' ridicule. Neurotheologian Dr. Andrew Newberg is trying to bridge the gap between the rational and the faithful. We've been studying a large number of different religious and spiritual practices and experiences using different types of brain imaging. The whole purpose is to see the variety of changes that go on within the person when they are engaged in different kinds of practices and especially when we see kind of the broad variety of experiences that people have that they consider to be religious or spiritual. We're trying to tap into that and try to understand how those experiences really affect a person and how they affect them not just subjectively but objectively as well by studying their biological responses. Today Dr. Newberg is researching what really happens inside the brain of someone speaking in tongues. He first injects a radioactive trace into Jerry's bloodstream and then asks the pastor to speak in tongues. The radioactive tracer records brain activity which can then be tracked in a scanner. Explain to me what is going on inside Jerry's brain. Um, what we're seeing on this slice here, these are slices through the brain, uh, as if we could just kind of made a cut here and pop the top of the head off, and you're looking down on the scan. And the way to look at this is that the areas that have the brightest amount of yellow uh, are considered to be the most active, and this is a measure of blood flow. Okay. The idea about how the brain works in general is that the more active a particular part is, the more blood flow it gets, the less active, the less blood flow it gets. And what we have found in, in our people speaking in tongues is a drop of activity in this frontal lobe, that part of the brain that would normally make them feel like they were in charge of what was happening to them. So I think that this at least supports the experience that they have, that whatever is coming out of them is not what they are in charge of. 
Und das ist immer lohnt, ich schalte das Gedacht, ich schalte das Gedacht, ich schalte das Gedacht, ich schalte das Gedacht. Does this prove that he isn't making this up, that this is a real experience he's happening? Well, it proves that neurologically there's something that's really happening that is associated with the kinds of experiences that he has. Now, if you're asking, is it a real experience, meaning that when he says, this feels like the spirit of God moving through him, I don't think this scan disproves it, I don't think it proves it. All it is showing is that when he has that feeling that God is actually speaking through him, that the parts of the brain that are his normal language areas are not being turned on. Right. So it's not, it's not him faking it, at least in the sense that he's not purposefully trying to produce this sound. Uh, so in that sense, it's not faking it. And I think it's a good thing to Dr. Newberg's research to date does appear to show that there is something going on in the brain of believers that is not the product of deliberate decision making. But that's a long way from saying this is proof that God is responsible. So, are you the scientist who's going to prove the existence of God? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a pre I don't have a previously arranged agenda as to whether I'm trying to disprove or prove God. I'd love to be able to do one or the other, um, but um, I, it, for me, I think that because we know so little about how we as human beings experience reality uh, and understand that reality, and because we exist in this infinite universe or almost, um, that I think it's very difficult for anybody to ultimately be able to do that uh, to say one way or another, just because. Everything that we think and feel and believe about the world is processed by the human brain. Unless we can find some way of essentially escaping that brain to see what is actually out there in the world, um, we may never get to that, to, to, to that knowledge. Dr. Newberg believes that Jerry is not just pretending to be able to speak in tongues. Whatever is actually happening, his brain is registering a real event of some kind. But how far can this go? Can simple faith overturn the laws of science? Can miracles happen? I want you to give the Lord the biggest shout of hallelujah. Come on. Benny Hinn is one of the world's most popular and charismatic preachers. He reaches an audience of tens of millions in over 190 countries, and his church receives over $100 million in donations and by selling DVDs like this one each year. He too claims that God speaks directly to him. At this rally in India in 2004, he drew a crowd of one and a half million. During the performance, the crowd became aroused by the sophisticated light show, the music, the excitement, and the offer of simple but miraculous solutions for all of life's problems. That was impeccably choreographed. The music suddenly came in as wow. Very, very slick, the whole operation. Clearly, he's a showman. He's a man. He he's knows, a huge show. I mean, yeah. this is a rock concert. This is, I mean, now the child is crying. He's completely overwhelmed. Why are you crying, baby? Why it may be crying? mere showmanship, but does it do any harm? Well, it depends how far you go with the idea that God is reaching out to yeah. touch you. Well, I mean, basically, faith healing goes back to ancient times. There have always been people around who claimed that they could perform these miracle cures. I mean, the best example, of course, would be Jesus in the Bible. But these people have always been around, and healing has always been taken as some kind of indication of being touched by the power of God and presented as evidence for the existence of God and that if you have enough faith, then you can be healed. Why did she just fall over? That apparently is called being slain in the spirit. So it's meant to be the kind of power of the Holy Ghost. Okay. It's going to fall backwards. Child. Child. Well, come on, give the Lord a mighty hand. Come on. Part of the message is about just believing in God and having faith in God and the idea that when we die, that's not the end. There is an afterlife. Now, that is a, something we all 
desperately want to believe. The evidence doesn't have to be that good to convince us because we want to believe it anyway. Pastor, he has a steel rod in his neck. He was going to have to wear that contraption for the rest of his life. But yesterday, God began to work the miracle. No independent medical evidence is ever presented to back up the claims of miracle cures. Depending on your beliefs, the sick and disabled brought out on stage are either swept up in the moment or genuinely being touched by God. I suspect that's not really a very good thing to do if you don't know what his medical condition is. What we'll see time and time again is there's no proper follow-up on any of these cases. These people have the excitement of the evening, they have these miracles, alleged miracles, paraded out in front of them, but there's no follow-up. Nobody goes back six months later to say, has that cancer really gone? Have you really been cured of this? Benny Hinn refused to take part in this program and he has also consistently failed to provide any valid scientific evidence to prove that any of the faithful are genuinely healed at his services. You deserve the glory. If, you, if you believe that you, know, you have a particular religious worldview and it helps you to make sense of the universe and gives your life meaning, fine. There's no, I can't kind of argue, I don't happen to agree, but I'm not going to take issue with that. If you're making claims that this has real effects in the real world, on real people, mm -hmm. then, okay, show me the evidence, convince me. And the evidence just isn't there in the case of miracle healing. The young man had a tumor in his back, and tonight, when you called out somebody being healed, the tumor disappeared in his back. So maybe this is where I demonstrate my own prejudice. While I strongly support the idea of a relationship between the brain and the body, mind over matter, the sight of sick people putting themselves into the hands of someone like Benny Hinn confirms for me how desperate people can be attracted to irrational solutions based on blind faith. But of course it's not just the simple, the desperate and the gullible who subscribe to belief in a world beyond provable fact. My friend and fellow broadcaster Jeremy Vine lives and works in a society where there is a broad consensus that science, not the supernatural, rules. But Jeremy is a man of faith. Rules. But Jeremy is a man of faith. It's very it's difficult to be a Christian in a post-religious world because um, anything that looks like certainty is immediately doubted. But when you say that anything to do with certainty is now doubted. What do you mean by that? Well, I, when I was initially a Christian, when I was about 21, I had a totally gung-ho approach to my faith. I thought, I felt totally certain. And I thought that, that certainty and faith are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that anyone who was doubtful was ignorant. So I said, certainty and faith are the same, ignorance and doubt are the same. Now I've switched around completely. I now think that, that certainty and ignorance are the same thing. The people who look the most certain probably know the least. The closest I've ever felt I've come to knowledge has been actually in prayer where I felt that I'm not the only person in this conversation. I'm praying to something and there's something there. Really, I, I think that, that there is a God. I, I think Christ was who he said he was, you know. Uh, maybe that makes me totally mad, but that's what I think. If, if your, your position, let's say, for the sake of argument, is God is not there, and my position is that God is there, I don't see that any one of us has any greater amount of evidence than the other. So I think in the end, probably, there's a lot of conditioning that comes into it. You think what you think because you're, you know, you're a certain type of person. I think what I think because, well, what is it, my parenting or my well, they're coming from a background in science, you set up your hypotheses and you, and you start from a, from a position of not knowing or only knowing what you can prove. And because it's, it cannot be proved, therefore, the position that I'm standing in, I'm taking with you, at the moment, has the greater weight. Yeah. Scientists uh, uh, prove wrong so often. Absolutely. And, and it's, when they are, it's embarrassing. But if one, of your, if one of your children was ill, who would you go to? The doctor or the church? The doctor. So, at the end of the day... The church would be the last resort. I think it would have to be the doctor initially. <laughs> of course it would be the doctor. What am I saying? I'd be arrested if I didn't take her to the doctor. Sure. But why do I say that with such conviction? I don't know. But I mean, um, maybe I'm concerned that, you know, I'm not ever sure that, I, that so how maybe... much healing goes on, you know, and, 
is healing a part of faith? Does it happen? Is it, if you believe, do you get healed? I'm not sure. If a person is made to feel better, happier, because they're convinced they've had a spiritual experience, does it really matter if there's no scientific proof of how it works? Surely what matters is that their health and happiness are restored. Psychologists use cognitive behaviour therapy, or CBT, to enable unhappy people to replace negative views with positive beliefs, and then help them to devise mental strategies to cope with their pain. But this sometimes means listening to beliefs that run counter to everything our scientific training has taught us. That's it, going deep, deep. So what are we to make of this? The woman with her back to the camera has a history of psychiatric problems. The man who is putting her into a trance is a consultant psychiatrist who used to work in the National Health Service. Please put Dr. Alan Sanderson has now turned away from the conventions of psychiatry and embraced what to non-believers may seem ridiculous supernatural rubbish. He calls it spirit release. Tell me your name. Sarah. So tell me, Sarah, how old are you? Now I think I'm about eight or nine. You're eight or nine? Yes. Dr. Sanderson now believes he can relieve mental distress in his patients by bringing out the spirits of the dead trapped inside them. You're here in the body of somebody who's uh, a grown woman. Do you understand that, Sarah? Not really. Not really? No. Tell me, Sarah, what happened to your physical body? It stopped breathing. Sarah, you've lost that body now. Um, the spirits sometimes think that the body belongs to them. So are spirits like parasites, then, in a way? Sort of living and feeding off the person that they yeah. Yes, you could, you could call them parasites. Right. They're not all spirits are parasites by any means. Um, it seems that many people have uh, spirits of a higher order who are there as their guides, spirits who have been alive in their bodies but have reached the point where they can be a guide to somebody. Sarah, you've lost that body now. You've lost that body. You're talking to me through a body which doesn't belong to you but your soul is here. That's how you're able to speak to me. Belief in possession by spirits flies in the face of everything I believe as a psychologist. So it's challenging, to say the least, to see another mental health professional who is encouraging his patients to believe that their problems can be solved by his casting out spirits. But these human spirits that you would communicate with in the session, these are spirits of people who have died? Yeah, not, uh, not necessarily. So it could be... The spirit of someone who's alive, because in the spiritual dimension we can be in more, more places than one at a time. So part of my spirit could actually be in somebody else while yeah. I'm alive? That's right. And Sarah, I'd like to help you to move on, to go to heaven. You can do that. Well, I think we'll ask you, Mum and Dad to come for you. That would be good. Mm. If you just look round and think strongly of your mum and dad, mm. I think you'll find that they're here. Yeah. Well, you then talk to the spirit. You see them now. And you need to find out why the spirit is there. And uh, you have to negotiate with the spirit. You find out, why, you find out, first of all, you say to the spirit, did you ever have a, a human physical body of your own? Right. And usually they'll say yes. Occasionally they just don't know. Occasionally they're confused. Spirits can be very confused. Mm. Uh, most of these spirits have died a sudden, a violent death. Mm -hmm. Because that's disorienting in itself. Ask your mummy if you come to take me to heaven. I can't hear her. You can't? Yes. She says yes. Look at her face. Tell yes. me. She's she happy to see you? Yes. She's really happy to see you, isn't she? Yes. Ask her another question. There's another question. Mummy, have you come from the light? Yes. Ask her again. Yes. Are you from the light, Mummy? Yes. And ask her once more. Are you really from the light? In his 40-minute yes. session with his patient, Dr. Sanderson believed he released the spirits of a young girl and her abusers from centuries earlier. Ask your Mummy, where is the light? Where is the light? Show me where the light it's is. It's behind her. It's behind her. Do you actually do you believe that you are releasing a spirit? 
I believe that I'm actually that spirits are actually being released. I was about to say I'm releasing spirits, well I'm not. That yeah. one releases and there's a lot of unseen help, yeah. but I'm helping the release of spirits. Of course, uh, there are times when you've got to take care that you're not leading your, your patients, suggesting things to them, and I'm very careful not to do that. Is there anything that you want to say before you go? You're ready to go now, aren't you? Good. Is there anything that you want to say before you go? You're ready to go now, aren't you? Good. All right. Well, you go with your mum. And uh, you go with our love and blessing. Dr. Sanderson sincerely believes he's helping his patients, though he accepts that as yet there is no independent clinical evidence that spirit release is safe or effective in treating people with psychiatric problems. Do you think one day, maybe, who knows how, in how many years, do you think spirit release therapy will be more part of the mainstream of the therapies available to people with mental health difficulties? I believe it will. Um, we know from research on uh, asking patients about their spiritual beliefs and their spiritual and their wishes that uh, those who have a strong belief in a spiritual worldview do much better when they're in a psychiatric institution or a mental health, uh, in some sort of mental health unit. They do much better than the ones who don't have this belief. All right. Is it just a matter of belief? I think they are sustained by a belief and by a worldview which makes sense. There's no way of knowing whether spirit release as practiced by Alan Sanderson gives his patients any genuine benefit, but it's clear that practitioner and patient genuinely believe it works. Religious and spiritual beliefs may confound the laws of science, but they also undeniably bring comfort and make sense of the world for many of us. I started my inquiry into what is normal when it comes to spirituality by spending time with two believers whose society treats very differently, but who turned out to have quite a bit in common. All star for the devil. That's why God's the referee of the universe, kids. And people say we don't need God. We don't need a meaning to life. We don't need another hero. We've already got one. Well, Phil the Evangelist is still out there, taking his message to the street, convinced that he must share with the world what God can offer as the answer to life's problems. The Carmelite nuns continue to live hidden away from the world, convinced that they can effect real change through their self-sacrifice and through the power of prayer. However, when Sister Mary first withdrew from the world, she did have a moment of doubt suddenly got the awful feeling that going into a Carmelite monastery is going to be like being buried alive. Mm -hmm. Everything that my life could have offered me, all the travelling I'd never done, the, the experiences I'd never had, all the enjoyment I wasn't going to taste, came flooding at me full and you know, strong in the face. Mm -hmm. And I had to say to myself, oh, what's all this? Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, no, I'm going to be a Carmelite. And somewhere there was a mocking voice in the background saying, but what if there's no God? What a fool you're going to be. And how did you answer that voice? Well, then I chose to be a fool. My coming to karma was an act of will because it was my choice. Seeing religious faith up close can be an exhilarating experience, and only a fool would deny that a spiritual life and devotion to a set of religious beliefs clearly brings great comfort and meaning to millions of lives. I think we're just beginning to discover how religious belief affects the brain and maybe mental health professionals need to open their minds and be less quick to diagnose disorder. But we also have to be prepared to say show me the evidence or stop raising false hopes. And until we have that evidence from those who claim miracles happen, vulnerable people may remain open to exploitation. If you've been affected by any of the issues in this evening's programme and would like to talk to someone in confidence for sources of further information and support, you can call the BBC Action Line on 0800 066 066. Lines may be busy, so please remember the Action Line is open seven days a week from 7.30am until midnight.